He's on the line. Good evening. The Planning and Zoning Commission meeting for Wednesday, October 14th, 2020 is called to order. Uh, welcome back to uh, in person and in the chambers. It's good to see everyone. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam Secretary, will you please uh, take the roll? Commissioner Ellison is present. Commissioner Clymer is present. Commissioner Steiner is present. Commissioner Maloney is present. Vice Chairman Barnes is on the line. Patrick uh, Chairman Bray is present. Uh, uh, Chair Commissioner Kish is absent. We have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, just wanted to note again that Commissioner uh, Vice Chairman Barnes is uh, joining us telephonically. And with that, I'll take a uh, motion to please excuse Commissioner Kish from this evening's meeting. Mr. Chairman, I uh, make a motion to approve uh, Mr. Kish from tonight the, uh, this meeting tonight. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Maloney, seconded by Commissioner Steiner to excuse Commissioner Kish from this evening's meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. I'm Mo sorry. I mean, <laughs> she's new to this. <laughs> Is it the in person thing that's it's the, the yeah, in person yeah. thing? It's got me all screwed up. <laughs> Please note Commissioner Maloney is an aye. Um, uh, Sounds like uh, Chairman. Vice Chairman Barnes is an I. Uh, motion <laughs> carries. Uh, agenda item number one, this is the uh, approval of the draft minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting held on September 16th, 2020. Those were posted online as a draft. Is there a motion to approve? I move that we approve the draft of the minutes. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Clymer, seconded by Commissioner Steiner to approve the draft commission meeting draft. minutes from September 16th, 2020. Is there any discussion? No. no. Seeing none, no. all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Now is the time for citizens who would like to address the Planning and Zoning Commission on any non-agenda items. Non-agenda items. Are there any speakers' cards? Emails? No. Perfect, thank you. Disclosure of ex parte communication. This is an opportunity for commissioners to disclose any ex parte communication prior to the meeting on any agenda items. Anything to disclose, commissioners? No. Mr. Barnes? Doesn't sound like it. Agenda item number agenda two. This is Agenda item number two, we're going to take that as no disclosure. Uh, agenda item number two is the Federico's at Pebble Creek use permit request uh, for convenience use. Uh, Christian, we haven't seen you in a while. Welcome back. Uh, we'll be uh, presenting tonight, and I will open the public hearing. Public Good evening. It's been quite some time since I've been over here. It's nice to see all of you. Hope you all are doing well. Um, so good evening, uh, Chairman Commissioner Bray and Planning and Zoning Commission. I'm here before you this evening with a request from Adrian Briseno to hear a use request, uh, a use permit request on a property within the city of Goodyear. The property is approximately 0.895 acres and it is located north of the northeast corner of Pebble Creek Parkway and Harvard Street. The property is currently zoned C2 General Commercial and the property is located uh, approximately where this little star is here on the vicinity map. So it's probably a little small to show you with a box, but it's right there where that star is. So zooming in a little closer, you can see that the project is within an existing shopping center 
and it is west of the Roosevelt Irrigation District Canal across from Evolution at Estrella Falls, which was formerly known as Live Goodyear, east of Pebble Creek Parkway, uh, across from the villages at Harvard Crossing, which is that new single family rental community. And the property is the same square, is in the same square mile as the Estrella Falls area, as well as Civic Square at Estrella Falls. looks like the rest of my notes did not print. So that's okay, we'll just swing it. So the it's, it's gonna be a new building. It's going to be 4,000 square feet in size. And currently on the property, you see some minimum parking improvements. And what the developer is proposing to do with the approval of this use permit is to construct a, a new building that will have a one drive-through uh, going around the back of the building and it will also have space for a second shop or suite or something in the nature of C2. So that's the proposal there. They do plan on having more parking than is required in the zoning. And um, it will be north of an existing commercial building. And that's kind of a, the conceptual rendering that they have right now. And this is a short presentation. But with that, we'd recommend uh, we've looked at the area, analyze the area, and with that, we'd uh, recommend approval of a use permit for a drive through restaurant and uh, in the C2 general, um, general commercial zone district. Thank you, Christian. Way to, way to wing it. Worked out well. Uh, any questions for staff? No? All right. Uh, with that, is the applicant here tonight, and does the applicant wish to address the commission? Okay. Mr. Chairman, can I interrupt for one second? Excuse me. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Bray is on the phone and he, uh, Bray, excuse me, Barnes is on the phone and he can hear us, can't um, but right now he can't respond. So we're going to try and give him an opportunity to speak after the commission is done with its deliberation here. The technicians in the back will mute everybody's phone. We'll let Commissioner Barnes say anything that he has on his mind and if Commissioner Barnes, you would say, I'm done, or give us a signal. We'll then turn everybody's microphone back off on from the back room. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, no applicant here. Any questions? Any speaker cards? Anybody from the public? Perfect. I will uh, close the public hearing. And before we move into a motion, uh, Vice Chairman Barnes, do you have any input on uh, this particular project, the uh, Frederico's? Uh, no, I have no input. Sounds good. So, uh, uh, with, okay. with that, we will move on uh, to a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve 20-300-0004, Fred Rico's at Pebble Creek. Is there a second? A second. Moved by Commissioner Clymer, seconded by Commissioner Maloney uh, to approve item number 20-300-0004, the Fred Rico's at Pebble Creek use permit request for convenience use. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed nay. Aye. All those opposed nay. Motion carries. Agenda item number three, this is uh, Avion at Ballpark Village PAD. Um, Christian, welcome back again. And Thank I will you. open the public hearing and turn it over to you. I'll get comfortable sitting in this chair for the next couple items, but uh, good evening. Um, I'm here with uh, before you this evening with a request from Ed Bull to conduct a rezoning on a property within the city of Goodyear. The property is approximately 153 acres, and it is located at the northwest corner of Estrella Parkway and Elwood Street. This is right across Estrella Parkway from the Ballpark Development Complex, and the property is currently zoned PAD under the Sun DS Farms Amendment. Zooming in a little closer, you can see that the subject property is north of the Estrella Crossing Business Park, east of Cerville Village, south of Estrella Vista, and west of both the, uh, both the Reds Development Complex and the other side of the future Ballpark Village development. 
the section of Ballpark Village, uh, this section of Ballpark Village, um, that it will, sorry, it will, on the other side of Ballpark Village, it will actually front some multifamily residential as well as some single family or co court home products. I will also point out that Wood Boulevard is proposed to come across the Strayer Parkway into Avion at Ballpark Village that will likely be with a traffic signal. So there will be a lot of connectivity between the currently, um, the currently zoned Ballpark Village and this proposed Avion at Ballpark Village. Additionally, Lower Buckeye Road is likely going to go across and connect to future developments within the Ballpark Village on the east side of Estrella Parkway. So you can see how these two developments are going to feel very linked. We will talk about this more throughout the presentation and about how this area will feel more like a character area and a special village within the city. For a little history on the property, and I'm gonna make this very brief or we'll be here all night. Um, in 2008, the property was first zoned for a project called Sun DS Farms. It included a mix of residential and commercial uses. In 2014, the project was amended, and in 2019, it was rezoned to include only a mix of single-family residential uses. The 2019 plan, which you'll see on the left, included 50-foot wide lots, 60-foot wide lots, 70-foot wide lots, Z lots, zero lot line lots, alley-loaded single-family detached lots, and alley-loaded single-family attached lots, as well as cluster product all with modified development standards though. So the Sun DS Farms PAD had a lot of custom land uses which would be very cumbersome for staff to administer. Without going into much detail on the previous proposal, I would like to say that the lot diversity also wasn't as certain as the PAD provided for flexibility to do quite a bit of the same lot on a lot of the property. Additionally, in contrast, the Avion at Ballpark Village proposal before you today has amenities not envisioned in the Sun DS Farms and more certainty as the product type and lot diversity that are going to be afforded within this project. So today, the proposal before us is the Avion at Ballpark Village, which will largely include R16 reduced, R14 reduced lots, as well as options for R1A, which is our single family attached, and or R1C, which are cluster homes or alley loaded homes. Those lots will be located on the southeast corner of the project. The lot diversity is more certain in this new development, and the development largely utilizes the city's existing standards, which makes it a lot easier for staff to administer, and the amenities, connectivity, and streetscape, streetscape elements staff believes will set this development apart from what we currently see of developments this size within the city. In some ways, you could say or call this development a mini master plan community, which also ties into the larger ballpark village development. So let's talk about a couple highlights from the amenities area. For amenities, there will be a central park that will be 30% larger than our standard at over seven acres. This will be visible from the main entrance of the community, which is located off of Wood Boulevard and Estrella Parkway. So if you imagine for a minute that you're leaving the ballpark village area on the east side, you come across on Wood Avenue or Wood Boulevard and you come across, you pass through their very manicured entrance and you'll make your way up to this massive seven acre community park. Off to the right on the north of the park, there will be a featured uh, community center, which will include a resort style pool with slimming lanes, a shaded kid area, a hot tub, and an open recreation center and gathering area with restrooms. There will also be pickleball courts, barbecue areas, and a tot lot and bike racks, which will also be included. The remaining sections of the park will also include some recreational fields, which could host two soccer games or other activities, and the park will be connected to decompose, uh, decomposed granite trails that run throughout the project. A visual of a similar community center the developer has built is pictured on the right, and that's located up in the meadows in the Camino Lago area of Peoria. The image on the right is a community, yeah, so that, that's the development they built. And then the exhibit on the left will show you the community center in relation to the park. A couple highlights from connectivity. A publicly accessible trail will surround the property, which will provide an eight foot trail made of both decomposed granite and some areas of traditional concrete path. There will also be trail access points to Pioneer Street, which is in Cerebral Village, and um, to a Cerebral Village HOA park, so that those residents of those neighboring communities can use the trail or traverse the property to gain access to the ballpark village area. So this infill project also really helps bring pedestrian activity to the residents west of here and get them to future destinations that we hope to have over closer to the ballpark area. Additionally, adjacent to Cerebral Village, there will be open space 
trails, and view fences to provide some visibility and accessibility between the two neighborhoods. The image on the bottom right shows the existing Pioneer Street at the end of Cerebral Village. This will, in the future, open up to, onto a green belt and have trail connections, which allows for these residents to access the trails and go around the community and, again, gain access to the other side of Ballpark Village. The walls for this project along Australia Parkway will include many open spaces instead of having a traditional solid block wall. They'll use some rail fencing. This will provide an open feel and view into the community and make it appear as though it is part of the greater Ballpark Village community and not just another subdivision along Australia Parkway. Again, the goal here is that when you drive down Australia Parkway, you're not passing by a dozen disconnected communities, but you feel like you've entered a unique and special part of this city. Um, uh, this mini master plan community will also add to your sense of arrival to the area. And just for some information on the wall on Australia Parkway, approximately 60 to 70% of that wall will be open and have a rail fence as opposed to that solid block wall. And the exhibit on the right shows the trail systems and paths in the blue, purple, and red dots that kind of connect through the community and around the community. To highlight some streetscape elements, a detached sidewalk will be used when a five-foot planting buffer can be provided for. The HOA will maintain the plants in the planting strip to ensure that they are maintained effectively and are replaced when they're damaged. And the single-family attached and cluster home area, if, we, if a five-foot planter area cannot be provided because of the front yard size, the sidewalk will be attached, but the HOA will maintain the trees on the resident side of the property and maintain the residential front yards to ensure that those shade trees are maintained and upkept. And an example of a detached sidewalk is in the picture on the upper left. Half of the homes in the R16 reduced and R14 reduced zone will have porches and courtyards. An example of a porch or a courtyard can also be seen on the picture on the left. And in the smaller R14 reduced lots, decorative pavers will be used in the front yards of all the homes. An example of that can be seen on the image on the right. So you can see those two houses have um, paver yards. And then for the R1A and R1C, the cluster and single family attached, um, when those use a six pack form or an alley form, they'll share one driveway cut for two or more homes so that, um, so that there's uh, not just a sea of garages as you're driving down the street, streetscape, but it feels nice and welcoming on the street frontage and it feels more pedestrian oriented. There will also be some very nice entry features at every entrance into the community. An example of the monument sign that will be placed on Wood Boulevard and Estrella Parkway is shown on the bottom. It will stand at 11 feet high and it will bring a grand sense of arrival. And in addition, Barnes. there will be He's one secondary entering. entry sign on Elwood Street, which is smaller at seven foot high, but essentially the same sign there. And there will also be two wall entry signs on the current, current Lower Buckeye Road, which will be more small concreted wall accents that kind of have that same articulation as the sign you see before you here. So there'll be some nice entries into this community. Now I want to point out an opportunity the city has to make navigating in our city a little less confusing as we add more population and residents to this special area of town. If you drive down Australia Parkway today from the north to the south, you hit Goodyear Boulevard North, followed by Yuma Road, followed by Goodyear Boulevard South. This would be that city center loop area, and there's three traffic signals here. Uh, then continuing south, you'll hit Lower Buckeye Parkway, which has a signal and in the future, it's very likely that you'll hit a lower Buckeye Road. As a note, unlike Goodyear Boulevard, the city center loops, good, uh, lower Buckeye Parkway and lower Buckeye Road, seen in this image, they don't connect and they don't loop back to one another. And um, you can see that from the graphic on the right side. So lower Buckeye Parkway functions more as the arterial in this area of the city. It goes west of Cerival Avenue through to Bullard Avenue. Um, Lower Buckeye Road between 159th Avenue and Bullard Avenue uh, will eventually function more like a collector road, and it won't go through. It will remain largely a road utilized by residents in the Ballpark Village area. So Lower Buckeye Road also does not have any homes, businesses, or anything addressed off of it in this area. So the city and the developer are exploring renaming this street in order to avoid future confusion as people look for that through street that will take them from Loop 303 in uh, Lower Buckeye, all the way to the ballpark area. So city staff is proposing that we rename the street or work with the developer to rename the street as Ballpark Village Boulevard, as it will connect the eastern side of Ballpark Village with the new Avion at Ballpark Village. This will also tie the two communities more cohesively together 
and establish a brand and identity for this area of the city. So the map illustrates um, the areas in Teal where the city will pursue renaming the street to lower, from Lower Buckeye Road to Ballpark Village Boulevard, and the areas in orange in the future would be named Ballpark Village Boulevard when constructed. The area in the red I want to discuss on the next slide. The area in red is a dead-end road that does not go through. This is visible in the image in the upper left. Beyond 157th Avenue, there are no more turn-ins to neighborhoods, and the road serves no meaningful purpose. The Avian at Ballpark Village Development proposes to remove this asphalt, er asphalt area and transform it into a well-landscaped area with a decomposed granite trail. Future Ballpark Village Boulevard would then end at 157th Avenue, as seen in the bottom left, and beyond this point, residents from Estrella Vista, Cerville Village, and Avion at Ballpark Village can access a two-mile trail, which will connect um, to points into Cerville Village and throughout the community. We believe this will serve as a net benefit to the city and future visitors and residents as they navigate this unique area of the city. Uh, the image in the upper middle shows where the road ends today, and the image in the upper right shows the area to be removed and transformed into a landscaped area and trail. And those are the highlights from this PAD. So with that, staff has evaluated the impacts of this proposed zoning to the greater community. And with no major concerns being found, staff recommends you forward an approval recommendation for rezoning the property from Sunday S Farms PAD amendment to Avion at Ballpark Village PAD, subject to the stipulations found in your staff report. And with that, I'll sit right here for questions. Thank you, Christian. Any questions for staff at this time? All right, I see the applicant, Mr. Bull, is in the audience, and I'm sure he would love to address us, I think. Do you want to address the commission? I mean, Christian did a really nice job selling your product, but. I think I want to repeat everything Christian said. <laughs> That's why we have in-person meetings, <laughs> just for you, Mr. Bull. But I won't. <laughs> it was very thorough. We appreciate the recommendations. Uh, you may wonder who is GY160. GY160 is under the Community Southwest family of companies. Mm -hmm. Some of you may remember when we were here probably about three years ago on behalf of Community Southwest, right across the street on Ballpark Village South. So they're no stranger to Goodyear and they're no stranger to this particular area. Uh, I think this is a wonderful, as Christian describes it, mini master plan extraordinary amenities uh, and when community southwest shows amenities like this as christian indicated they build them uh, and we've had the opportunity to work with them on many developments in a variety of cities and this will be a wonderful diverse well amenitized development we appreciate the recommendation i'm not aware of any opposition and we accept uh, all of this 19 stipulations two of which i think were cleaned up just today Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Alyssa, for getting those done. Any questions for the Good. Any questions for the applicant? I got a little question about it's tiny minutia, but I've been here many years. I, I haven't seen too many rail fences. Where are those rails going to be made of? They're not wood, are they? No, they'll be a, a, a plastic. Plastic, yeah, plastic, plastic uh, wood type. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, okay, I just wonder. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll look nice, and it'll be something different because you. You either see iron fences, you know, or or you see uh, just walls. So yeah, it, yeah, it's different. Um, it's something that we used in some other parts of the valley, and we've learned over the years to uh, find something other than wood. I imagine We're, similar to Vanderbilt Farms. I bet probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any comments from the public? Any speakers' cards? No. Any final questions for staff or the applicant? I do have one. With all the trails and the connectivity between the communities, crossing from the west side of Australia to the east side of Australia, is that going to be done at the stoplight walking cross, or will there be something that will bridge them over a straight parkway to get there. So if a light is warranted, then there's a potential for a signal at Lower Buckeye Road, which we we're going to propose as Ballpark Village Boulevard or Wood Boulevard if a light is warranted or 
if needed. There's already a signal down at Elwood Street, which Elwood turns into Bullard. So that's a great path that gets you right up to the ballpark area. Okay. So Thank that you. signal exists today. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Vice Chairman Barnes, is he still with us? Do you have any comments? I have no comment at this time. No comments. Perfect. Um, with that, I'll close the public hearing and I'll ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I motion that we approve um, the Avion Park Village Planned Area Development. It's number 2-20-210. Dash 0001. A second. It has been moved by Commissioner Maloney, seconded by Commissioner Clymer to approve the Avion at Ballpark Village, uh, item 20 210 0001. Is there any discussion? Discussion seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion aye. carries. Motion carries. That was a nay from Vice Chairman Barnes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Good to see uh, you. No, that, that was an aye for me. It's just delayed. We have that on the record. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Good luck with the project. Agenda item number four. This is the district at Civic Square PAD overlay. And looking there, Christian, you haven't been with us for a while, and now you're taking up the whole show. I know. I'm getting <laughs> greedy. I've, I missed you guys. All right. <laughs> missed you all. All right. So back here again. I'm here with a request from Wendy Riddell to conduct a rezoning on a property within the city. So the property is approximately 9.3 acres located east and northeast of the corner of Monte Vista Road and Pebble Creek Parkway. The property is currently zoned PAD under the Goodyear Plan Regional Center Commercial PAD. Zooming in a little closer, you can see that the project is north of the market at Estrella Falls. It is adjacent to the Bullard Wash Park, south of Evolution at Estrella Falls, formerly known as Live Goodyear, and just across Bullard Wash from the future, uh, from future residential that will be a part of Civic Square at Estrella Falls. And west of the project is the Roosevelt Irrigation District RID Canal and a C2 commercial center where hopefully we'll be able to get some tacos here really soon. Frederico's. <laughs> All right. So as it relates to the general plan land use, the project falls in the business and commerce area. I will point out that Live Goodyear, or Evolutions at Estrella Falls, and the residential developments under construction right now in Civic Square at Estrella Falls are all within this general plan land use. So I'll point out that those developments are here and here. So this, and this project also falls within a close proximity to transit oriented development overlay and is in a close proximity as well to the village center overlay. And for a little history on the property, the project was initially zoned as part of Goodyear Plan Regional Center planned area development commercial uses back in 2000. Much of the northern and western portions of that PAD have now been rezoned to be included in the Civic Square at Estrella Falls PAD. This project seeks to rezone this portion of the PAD to allow for a transition from the commercial uses to the west and south to medium and high density residential to the north and east. You also may recall that this site was brought before you for a discussion in 2019 with a use permit for mini storage. The property and the proposal have not yet come to fruition, so the parcel currently remains vacant. So the basis of this zoning is the city's MF24, which typically permits a 24 units per acre zoning. I will highlight some of the major changes that are proposed within this PAD overlay. That this PAD overlay proposes the allowance for 39 units per acre. This allows for the development of a proposed 352 unit apartment complex. The mix provides for four studio apartments units, 174 one bedroom units, and 174 two bedroom units. In addition, while height does not equate to stories, the PAD proposes a height limit of 60 feet, which would allow the developer to construct three and four story buildings on the property. With the currently allotted 40 foot height, in MF24, it is not easy to construct a three or four story building with the height of the ceilings that luxury units often afford their residents. And the density being requested would not 
also be attainable. Additional modifications were made to the setbacks, parking, design, and how the building interfaces with the street to create a walkable urban environment. And I will highlight those on the next slide. Setbacks have been reduced along the front side of the complex, which is along Monte Vista, to allow for a more urban and walkable feel. All the units which have patios on the first floor, street side, will also have gates which allow them direct access to Monte Vista, which makes it easier, more walk uh, walkable to that Civic Square at Estrella Falls area. Units on the east side will also feature a patio with direct access to paths that will border the Bullard Wash Park. Setbacks on the west and north have been reduced as they push up to that existing evolutions at uh, Estrella Falls multifamily and also the backside of the Roosevelt Irrigation District Canal. Parking in this development will be provided via a mix of garages, tandem parking spaces in front of the garages, covered parking, and open parking, as well as tandem open parking. The developer is requesting 1.5 spaces for the two bedroom units as opposed to two. The developers found that in their communities, which they've built many across the valley, not all two bedroom units have uh, two tenants or two vehicles. So in order to provide the city with some, however, in order to provide the city with some assurances as it relates to the parking, they will be providing us a parking management plan to the city, which will be approved as part of the site plan. And, and um, so that they're gonna provide that when, when we approve the site plan in order to sure up that parking uh, calculation and how the parking plan management and enforcement will work. An example of a tandem space in front of a private garage can be seen in the upper left corner. That's from a project that they currently have within the valley. And as it relates to amenities, the developer will be building a minimum uh, 9,500 square foot clubhouse, a resort style pool, shaded areas, a dog park and wash station, fitness centers, an outdoor barbecue and turf area. And an example of the pool area can be seen in the above center depiction. So you'll see that there's a pool with some seating areas in this grass area and then some really cool, unique, uh, different types of seating arrangements. Additionally, in order to ensure the buildings are visually interesting, architecturally unique, and do not appear um, just monolithic, if you will, or cookie cutter, the developer will um, have to provide at least four color options, as well as provide other features to provide visual interest on the buildings. As you can see from the image on the bottom, the building has various base colors and vertical elements, staggered roof lines and treatments, which make the buildings appear to be more like several buildings next to one, other, one another. I would call it more of a row house feel, as opposed to one giant apartment building repeating over the site over and over again. This gives visual character from the streetscape and park perspective. The park side perspective can be seen in the image on the upper right. This will set this design of this complex apart from those that we generally see in the city today. It will bring a sense of urban arrival to the Civic Square at Estrella Falls Village Center area. And staff has evaluated the impact of this proposed zoning with the greater community. And with no major concerns being sta found, staff recommends you forward an approval recommendation for rezoning of the property from Goodyear Plan Regional Center Commercial Plan Area Development to District at Civic Square Plan Area Development Overlay, which includes, includes multifamily uses, a density of 39 units per acre, modified development standards, and design enhancements subject to the staff report stipulations. With that, I'm happy to take questions. And Chairman, if you could open the public hearing. Oh, open the public hearing, it's opened. Thank you, Christian. Um, any questions for Christian at this time? Is the applicant here no with questions. us tonight? They are, yes. Do you wish to address the commission? Mr. Chair, uh, Wendy Riddell with the law firm Barry Riddell, 5750 East Camelback. Honestly, Christian's on quite a roll, so unless there are specific questions, uh, and or unless you want me to go through a full, a full presentation, I'm happy to field questions. Okay, that sounds good to me. Any questions for the applicant? No. no. Man, okay. Christian is doing a good job. He is. He's tired. Uh, that's what I'm. Yeah, he's not. He's not out there looking for a job, we, right? He's got to have a big raise, though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um. All right. Is there uh, any comments from the public or any speakers' cards? I've received one speaker card for Mark Pelletier. Mr. Pelletier. 
I think it's uh, three it's here. minutes. Yes. Correct? Yes. yes. Chairman Bray, Commissioner, my name is Mark Pelletier. I live at 15742 West Paramount here in Whittier. I uh, speak in objection to the pad overlay requested here. Having served on the Goodyear 2025 uh, Plan Commission, I accept and understand the desire for a mix of residential properties in Goodyear, including high density, as defined in the MF24 category. But we are seeing more and more relaxation of building separations and setbacks, particularly, often with regard to admittedly challenging infill sites. And this proposal substantially expands the scope and concept of proposed variances. The applicant says in their narrative, the following are required. You note they don't say requested. 62% more dwelling acres, dwelling units, 50% height increase, 66% reduction in separation in one dimension, and over 85% in another. Tandem parking and the necessity of an on site parking monitor. Parking space reductions, given what I heard tonight about the mix of units, it sounds like it's probably about 80 spaces, reducing the two bedroom units from two per unit to one and a half. That's a quick calculation. I stand corrected if I'm wrong. I also heard tonight, which I didn't perceive from the narrative or anything about design standard variations being requested. In the applicant's narrative, talking about open space, but which seemingly can and should be applied to the entire project, they state, quote, to achieve a dense urban form that best responds to the goals for this area. Well, I submit that perhaps creating a dense urban area is the goal of the applicant. It doesn't seem to me that that is the goal of our zoning ordinances as written without substantial variations as are being requested here tonight. Obviously, we have a lot going on adjacent to this in the city center. Some of that's already at least passed through various steps. I think this level of variation represents a potential precedent to be sent for other areas, to, to be present for other areas in the Civic Center and throughout the city. We have all wanted a city Civic Center since the mid 80s, when we changed from being the town of Goodyear to the city of Goodyear. But is this really what we mean by city? I urge you to very severely reconsider and not approve the overlay as presented. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. Um, are there any other speakers cards or anyone from the public that wish to speak? Okay. Are there any final questions from commission members for staff? Uh, Vice Chairman Barnes, do you have any comments on this particular project? Uh, no comments from me. Okay, thank you. With that, I will close the public hearing and I will take a motion on this PAD overlay. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve 20-210-00002. I second. It has been moved by Commissioner Steiner, seconded by Commissioner Maloney to approve um, the district at Civic Square PAD overlay, item number 20210-00002. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Aye. Okay, so... Will you, did you get that? Vice Chairman Barnes is an aye. And Commissioner Ellison is a nay. All right. With that, motion carries. Thank you. And then you, obviously, sir, you, under, you know 
that it goes to the council next. And I think is it this coming Monday, Chris, or the following? Should be October 26th. Correct. Yes. 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 October 26th. Where they'll have the final approval. Understood. Thank you. Thank you again for taking time to come out and address the commission. Agenda item number five. This is the amendment of uh, Article Seven and Nine of the Zoning Zoning Ordinance. And Steve gets to present now. We haven't seen him in a while either. I will open the public hearing and turn it over to Steve. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commission members. I asked Christian to present for me, but he declined. So. <laughs> okay, so tonight before you, we have a zoning ordinance text amendment, Article 7 and 9 for electronic message displays. And just some background, zoning ordinance, Article 7, that's the article that specifically regulates signage. So that regulates all signage within the city of Goodyear. Uh, the next article we're going to amend tonight, Article 9, is special districts, basically unique areas in the city meeting unique requirements. Uh, specifically, we're going to amend Article 9-2, which established the McDowell Road Business and Entertainment District, which on this map, if I can get there, basically McDowell Road, you had all of the commercial developments along McDowell Road, basically from 145th all the way over to Cerebral. And the intent of creating that district was to allow uh, the electronic message displays for those commercial uses. And as defined in the zoning ordinance, uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight, the electronic message displays, basically that's your type of video type of sign that you'll see around the valley. Uh, compared to a reader panel sign, which is more the manual type of sign placement of letters or numbers. Now, for the electronic message displays, generally they're prohibited by the zoning ordinance. So we do not have a lot of those signs within the city. Uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, the McDowell Road District we talked about. Fueling stations, you'll see that, that that's a requirement for their pricing. So they're allowed to have that type of sign. Also, schools, well, we would, the zoning ordinance does not apply to schools, so you'll see schools have type, those types of signs. Also, the city has a couple of digital marquees. It's a different type of sign, but same kind of technology that you'll see with that display. Uh, June 8th, staff took a work session item to the council, and basically the direction from the council was that they would like to see greater use of the electronic message displays within the city to offer that as an option for businesses. And so what staff is, what we did was we looked at amending the zoning ordinance according to the council direction. And what we thought was we would permit the electronic message displays on the monument signs for those businesses. And so the monument sign being typically the signage that you see, the ground signage that you see along the streets. And we, that would be allowed in commercial and industrial zoning districts within the city, which would also include any PAD that has an underlying commercial or industrial zoning. And with that change, it would require an amendment to the zoning ordinance, which would require the hearing before this body and then city council for final approval through the public hearing process. The provisions that staff that we're proposing right now, the change to Article 7 would be allow the electronic message display on a monument sign. And again, this is the type of signage that we are looking at to allow the display to be on a portion of that monument sign. Uh, the image would be static, so there'd be no video, no scrolling, no animation, no movement at all with the image. And that image would have to be up for at least eight seconds and then it would need to be an immediate transition to the next image. Uh, nighttime, that is the concern with these type of signs, how bright it is. So we've built in a dust till dawn maximum light uh, 
measurement of 300 nits. And basically a nit is a measurement of the light that the display is giving off. So that will be 300 nits. The sign will be shut off from 10 p.m. till dawn if it is located within 150 feet of a single family zoning district, again, to try to avoid any issues of light trespass into a single family neighborhood. We're also building in, if it's not working, if the image is moving too fast, if you have a whiteout condition, that the sign will need to be shut off immediately. And also, uh, no offsite advertising. This sign, it's, it's supposed to be advertising a business that is on the property, no offsite advertising, which that is a general provision in the zoning ordinance. It's all signage. It needs to be advertising a signage of a use that's on the property. And how big could that electronic message display be? What we're looking at is 50% of the allowable copy area or 24 square feet, whichever is less. And so looking at a couple examples, this one here is the monument sign for the Canyon Trails Town Center, the Super Target Center there at Cotton and Yuma. It's a large sign. It's 20 feet tall. It has 150 square feet of copy along these multi-tenant panels. So what the proposed amendment would allow would be 50% would be 75 square feet or 24 square feet. So the lesser of the two is the 24 square feet. So they could have a 24 square foot electronic message display on this sign. Uh, moving over to a smaller sign, the sign's only eight feet tall. It's a one single user sign. So that sign could have a maximum of 32 square feet of copy area. So given the provisions that we're proposing, uh, you could have either 16 square feet, which is 50%, or 24 square feet. The lesser is 16 square feet. So they would get 50% of their copy area that they could use an electronic message display, which is this area right here. Uh, the basis for a lot of these standards that we mentioned, the 300 nits, state seconds, the immediate transition, uh, those are taken from uh, Arizona Revised Statutes along that their recommendations for outdoor advertising signs that utilize digital displays. Uh, those standards are pretty much adopted Valley-wide, so most of the cities that do allow these signs have adopted those provisions. Uh, we in Goodyear, we have adopted those as well when we did the McDowell Road District, as well as the city's mar digital marquees. Uh, the next article that we're amending is Article 9, and that's the Special Districts article. And basically what we're doing here is, since we are proposing to allow the electronic message displays on a more citywide basis, the district is no longer needed since that's what its sole purpose was to allow the electronic message displays. So we're recommending that Article 9-2, that that'll be deleted from the zoning ordinance. Uh, looking at other municipalities, you can see where they're not allowed to then where surprise allows them on monument signs and to where these cities allow them on monument signs as well as wall signs. And then where a separation from residential, the 150 feet that I previously mentioned, you'll see that these four cities do have something built into their codes to offer some protections for single family residential. Uh, because it was a public hearing, we did comply with our public notice proceedings. That was a display ad in September 25th. Uh, we put this on our current development page so we could offer information on the proposed amendment to the public. Uh, it was emailed to uh, stakeholders from our economic development department, had over 1,300 businesses and stakeholders on an email blast that was sent out. And basically that blast took the form of a Q&A uh, information on what was happening, any questions that they had along with an answer. Uh, more import importantly, it also had contact information to contact city staff for more information. Uh, to date, we have not received any opposition to this proposed amendment. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, we are recommending uh, that the commission recommend approval of the change to Article 7 and 9 
and it will proceed then to October 26th City Council hearing. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation. Available for any questions. Uh, thank you, Steve. Are there any questions for staff? This this came from City Council to begin with. This, they, they originally pushed this along. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Mervis, yes, the direction is from City Council. I, I guess I'm old fashioned. I'm not. I'm never was a fan of those things. But <clears throat> I have a question, Patrick. Uh, Vice Chairman Barnes, please proceed. So, uh, my question to Steve: How close? a residential district could one of these signs potentially be? Mr. Chairman, commission members, the sign could, there's no specific setback or separation required for the sign from a single family zoning district. Uh, the provision is if it's in 150 feet, then it'll have to shut off at nighttime. Again, being nighttime is the con er the time of concern with these kinds of signs, the light trespass. Commissioner Barnes, did you hear that? And do you have any other questions? Uh, I did hear that and I have no other questions. You did not hear that, is that correct? Do you want Steve to repeat it or can you hear me? No, I, I did hear that. Okay. Uh, affirmative, I did hear. A Pam Pam thing, yeah, I get it. Commissioner Ellison. So just to follow up the, for an example, the single family rental homes that are on Estrella uh, north of McDowell on the west side of the road, uh, there's businesses across the street. You've got the barbershop. Papa John's, that kind of thing. They could have signs out there, but would they, because of the, the proximity to the homes, they'd have to shut off at 10 p.m.? Mr. Chairman, commission members, it would if, and I apologize if I misheard, if it was a single family zoning district, if it's multifamily, the provision uh -huh. does not apply. So it would be single family districts. Um, my question is, is and that I, I didn't see it in all of this, but is there something or somewhere maybe a city has done that or look, you know, I think about what, what you talk about going down McDowell and I mean, even at night, right? If you get on that right plane, like sometimes your eyes will play games with you just on the lights, right? So is there some distancing on the signs themselves? Meaning, I mean, if you look at where the signs are now, if every one of those had a, some sort of a digital sign and there's, you know, they're flashing. I mean, is there some sort of a study or, or research about maybe they need to be, I don't know, 200, 500 yards apart, um, not parallel with each other, you know, that kind of thing so that, I mean, it doesn't impair someone's driving abilities at night. Mr. Chairman, commission members, I personally do not recall seeing any studies on closeness necessarily that doesn't mean they're not out there but the main thing that i saw was the main concerns are brightness and animation or movement so that's why we try to address the brightness with the cap at night and then the other main concern is the image needs to be static so you would not have flashing or movement it definitely has to be a static image with immediate transition to the next image. So you should not see flashing or movement, scrolling, any kind of movement. And I think that's a good thing, but even with the change to the next image, I mean, that catches your eye, um, and especially at night, and I just, well, I guess my request would be that I, I think that that should be taken under consideration, especially in an area like that where you have so much commercial down one street that, I mean, it doesn't mess, you know, we don't turn it into Las Vegas Boulevard, even though some of us yeah, may well, enjoy like, that. <laughs> I don't exactly want Commissioner right. Maloney to wreck trying to go home at night from a <laughs> And I don't know, maybe this is something that's not thought about, but in my mind, I, you know, if these 
signs are, you know, closer than normal, does it potentially become a safety hazard on, on some of those areas? Mr. Chairman, if I can just add in real quick, and Steve can is much more knowledgeable on this than I am, but our the this amendment to the ordinances tonight allows for electronic message centers or digital signage as part of the monument signage and so forth for the individual businesses. And the city already has standards where those can go. Essentially, they can go at driveway locations, if I remember correctly, Steve. So you won't have them um, like back to back or so forth. They will be separated as the normal monument signage is separated today. If, okay. that, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And I just, and that's what I was wondering because I knew that there was already some standard there, but is it, I guess my question is, does the city or our specialist at the city feel like that is enough for this type of sign? That's just the question. And I'm, you know, I think it's, you know, it's good that we're adopting those technologies, but I think that's just something that in my opinion, I'd like the record to reflect, and maybe if before you go to uh, city council, have looked into that possibly. Mr. Chairman, commission members, I think to follow up on Christopher as well, there is, there are a lot of studies on these type of signs, and you have different groups recommending different levels of brightness, and it just depends on the group like the International Dark Sky Association would have it really low, or the Outdoor Advertising Association has it where we're at. We're, we're also following the state and the Outdoor Advertising Society. These are levels that they say are bright enough, but are not a safety hazard to vehicles, people traveling on the roadways at night. So that's, again, another reason why we adopted follow through on the state standards. But there are studies out there and. I mean, we can look at them again, but like Christopher said, we have built in, we do not have a lot of monument signs. Basically, they're only at the driveways and they have to be 150 feet apart at least. So this does not allow anybody to get any more monument signs. They, they'll go on either existing signs already approved through the city or if it's a new development, then it could be a new sign. But otherwise, it's only allowed on the existing signs that are out there. So that's you hit on that point, and it kind of answers it. So if monument signs can only be 150 feet apart, I mean, you can't put them any closer together, then my question then is, are we confident that there is no safety issue that if those – signs were both had some sort of electronic message on them with the stipulations we have today there is no safety hazard because i'm trying to visualize i mean that's just there could be a lot going on down a thoroughfare and i'm, I'm thinking solely at night that, that there just could be, even though we're trying to limit the movement and the brightness i get that but just that instant change to a sign is going to catch someone's someone's eye and if there's multiples going on does that cause a safety concern i guess so I, I don't know if we've dug that deep and if we haven't i mean i understand but that's just i want to raise that that concern especially for a high you know high signage area um mr chairman commission as steve mentioned that this the standards for brightness in the eight seconds and the, and the um, static images and so on and so forth um, and the transition and the lack of video, those are all based on essentially, um, and Steve, correct me if I misspeak here, but essentially they're national, national standards. Those are the same standards that are used um, along interstates, are very similar standards that are used along interstates and very high traffic corridors. Now, if, admittedly, interstate signage is typically higher Right, um, but it's still there's more traffic, um, but it is the application of those standards essentially to uh, more localized streets. I think I said that accurately, Steve. Do you agree? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Again, to follow up on Christopher, we're we're incorporating standards that uh, basically most of the valley has adopted that do have these signs. If we did not have the protections built in, then I. 
I guess we wouldn't feel comfortable moving forward if we did not have the protections built in. But we feel like between the transition, the static images, our built-in spacing requirements, the cap at night, and the provision, the separation from residential, that we've addressed the safety concerns, the light trespass, the adverse impacts to single family as best we can, and that it'll be hopefully an amenity to the business community and citizens while all, but not having any adverse effects. So we've adopted the national standards, the, the state standards that have been uh, reviewed and vetted. So we feel comfortable in that regard. Okay. Commissioner Maloney. Steve, my concern is that, um, you know, mine isn't so much the brightness and all that. It, my concern is that, you know, Goodyear is growing in leaps and bounds. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And we are so careful about when a business comes in, even a warehouse, that, the, um, that they have to have, you know, the front of the building. We have to have the, the beautiful plants. And they've got to grow. You know, we have to have the trees. And I think that that is, that's great. But when I think of my visualization of, of driving down, you know, uh, Pebble Creek Parkway or Stray, you know, I, I, all I can think of is Las Vegas. And I know I heard what you said, but I mean, I don't get why we have to do this. I don't, I mean, is the, what is the business community getting out of that? The, the, the flash, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. It's just not hitting me right. You know, and I just, I mean, I, there must be something that I'm missing. So, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Maloney, I will say that we, um, as Steve pointed out, the city's uh, signed ordinance previously didn't allow these ex except in limited circumstances and those that are exempt, like the schools, as Steve pointed out. And we did have this work session with council and it was, um, my recollection was that it was unanimous direction from council for us to pursue this. There was some um, uh, conversation between some members of the business community and, and the council in terms of uh, maybe in creating some more flexibility and adaptability to new signage technologies. And so we presented um, what the current standards were or are um, and then talked through that with the council in a very productive work session and that they directed us to pr please proceed with amending the signed ordinance to allow uh, electronic signage. So that's what we're, that's what we're here tonight to do. Okay. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Allison. No, I, I, so my question is from what you displayed on all the other cities, it seems as though Goodyear is the last, one of the last, to enact something like this, to, to allow digital signs. Obviously, there are some cities that don't, but for the majority, allow some kind of digital sign. And it puts us, and I'm asking the question, I'm not, I don't want to make an assumption, but it, so, it seems as though it puts us as a, at a disadvantage for attracting businesses. Is that the case? Is that some of the concern that the city council had moving forward? <laughs> Not it. I don't see the I don't see the name Tempe in there anywhere. So, Mr. Chairman, um, Commissioner Ellison, I, I'm not sure I would say the words disadvantage is it puts the city or anything at a disadvantage, because um, I'm not sure that the city has really not been able to have a locate because of it. Okay. So I, I don't want to speculate on that one way or the other. Um, but what I would say is that there was a de desire from council for us to modernize this portion of our sign ordinance to get up and create, ensure the public is safe. Obviously, we all agree on that, the, mot the motoring public is safe. But come in line with new technology and the desires of uh, businesses as they evolve over time. And I think fundamentally, that was the direction, and that's why we're here. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
So let me ask you this. Let's just take um, Australia McDowell. There's the also there's Olive Garden, that commercial area, right? And it basically is pretty much built out from Australia Parkway to the wash, correct? For the most, yeah, it's all built out, right? So I'm trying to picture that area. Potentially just for that commercial center, is there three or four monument signs on that deal? Three. Two on McDowell and one on Estrella? House by the um, um, Red Lobster, and then one further down, I believe. So three on McDowell. Three on McDowell. Yeah. I mean, maybe I mean we're spitballing, right? But I mean, is that you think that's about right? And that's that's my question: is you think about from Bullard to Estrella? I don't know. That's not it's a mile. Mile is it a mile? I think. And so within a mile on one side, you could have three electronic signs just on one side of the road. And then, and that's why I'm getting, I'm not saying the brightness and the distance I'm saying at night, what does potentially six electronic signs within a mile look like to a driver? And, and, and it's not the, it's with where we're at today with the brightness level that we put in because of those standards, but that's my question. Should we go a step further and say we should only have one within a mile or two within a mile? Or is that too restrictive? I mean, that that's my question because th that's why I think we get to the whole Las Vegas Boulevard. If you have six of them in a mile, that seems to me to be a lot. Uh, yes, sir. And Steve, please chime in here if I need some correction or you want anything to add. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, what I'll say is like that center there was already located in the Bullard Avenue, um, not the Bullard Avenue, the McDowell Entertainment District, Correct. which already had the allowance for them to have digital signage should they have wanted it. And they chose not to do it, which is fine. Just because we're creating this allowance doesn't require anybody to do it. Um, I would also say that on, on shopping centers and so forth, how many of them, what's the percentage, Steve? Probably 99, 100% of them have comprehensive sign um, plans that look at the center from a holistic percent, uh, from a holistic view in terms of signage so all the businesses can be successful. And with those, we're taking the approach of if you have an existing comprehensive sign plan and you want to have or add in electronic signage, then you just come back through and amend the, amend the comprehensive sign plan. So, um that what we're doing tonight or what what we're proposing tonight, I should say, excuse me, is simply to say as part of the signage um, allowable for businesses, you can have up to 50% 50 50 of your area or 24 square feet, whichever is less. It's not more signage. It's just allowing this type of signage as part of the signage for your business, if that makes sense. And that, and I agree with that. And I don't, I'm not opposed to the electronic signage whatsoever. I'm just trying to visualize is three within a mile. Does that create a safety hazard is, is my question. Or is it, is it also create something unappealing that down the road, we're going to look at it and go, yeah, we like basically created a Las Vegas Boulevard and we shouldn't have. So with the size, with the size limitation and the brightness, so there's, I don't think there's a safety issue okay? because we're pegged to the national standards and everything that's Steve had pointed out in terms as to the number of them. Um, all we're saying, I think we could probably also have that debate is, is there too many, um, is there too many monument signs? Should it be one every other driveway? Right. I agree with that. But the city had make that are already made the, decision to say let's have business signage at every, allowable business signage at every driveway should they choose to do it and um so that's been the standard for was that 2017 when we updated the sign ordinance i can't remember as a result of the supreme court case or 18 recently way Let, back and it was further back than we think i think yeah <laughs> i was time, here for it but time flies <laughs> right um not too long ago so we we added that provision in so um, the, I think even if 
for some reason the electronic signage didn't get approved through council but I, it will because they gave us the direction um we still have all the monument signs at every driveway right. so this is just converting some of that allowable signage on those monuments to digital and we don't believe we're going to have a safety issue and they still would have to come to the commission for approval comprehensive sign plan it goes through council yeah if you're part of a shopping center so yes yes excuse me it could, yeah it, that would be every, comes, everybody right. it would be a monument sign yeah correct. okay correct. okay correct. Correct. Would there Center. be, um, I understand what everybody's saying. It's like you're driving down a hallway if they're all the big monument signs and, you know, they're close together. If you added a variety of sizes as opposed to one monument large, one monument large, right down, and you added sizes throughout, would that be a better way to go? Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Steiner, that. Commissioner Steiner, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, and I'm going to say something here. I may get hit in the head from our city attorney, deputy city attorney behind me. She's probably wanted to hit me in the head for a long time, so she might relish that opportunity. <laughs> but nevertheless, no, um, tell us. I think that really then you get back to the almost a free speech thing. Why, If this one can have a sign that's 24 square feet, why can't I have it? And I'm just 100 feet down the road. No. Um, so... I think then we, we need to have uniform standards that applies throughout the community, throughout the city, so that everybody has the same ability and right to have that type of signage, if that makes sense, and not pick and choose between one or two businesses. Um, if, if you happen to, if Steiner Restaurant comes in first and you happen to get the big sign, but Maloney comes in second and that one can't have as big a sign as yours, you know, she's going to say, well, why can't I? He did. He's just across the street. So, you know, it, we, we want to have um, uniform standards that can apply fairly throughout the community. Um, right. But I, I think that you want to be sure that you maintain the uh, aesthetic beauty of the city also, as, as opposed to this Las Vegas um, scenario that we've been discussing. Yes, sir. I don't disagree with you at all. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm sure th this is the case, but I just want to check with you, Steve. When you look at these cities, the ones that don't allow it and the monument signs, uh, obviously a surprise is one of the ones you found. Do Well, because we all went through that big package of signage stuff because of the Supreme Court ruling. So do our stipulations mere surprise already and and as far as monument signs are concerned so we're you know the only the only thing that it doesn't is this light lighted sign or visual or, or electronic sign mr chairman are you asking about general sign regulations being consistent with other valley cities yeah so basically what i'm saying is Let's go back to my example. If we had three on that deal, could, would the, does the city surprise allow the same thing so they could have the same exact scenario as we do here? Or their monument signs, they can only have two within a mile. And so they allow, you know, their, their city's going to look, it's going to look different, right? And that, that's what I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around, I guess, really – Again, I'm not opposed to the virtual. I'm all these questions though about what does it look like at the end of the day. You know, I, I don't want it to look like Las Vegas Boulevard either, unless we're going to get to casinos. But <laughs> not even then. <laughs> okay, so we disagree. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, Mr. Chairman, Commission members. I don't know if this answers the question, but from my experience, not not from any study, detailed study, but just from experience uh, being here through several years and being familiar with other cities, uh, Goodyear was typically on the conservative side in terms of signage for um, since, you know, the 90s and the growth, all the growth that we've seen. Goodyear's uh, typically maintained a more conservative stance on signage. And again, that's why you, you see here on this uh, screen here, 
several cities already allowing such signage where we're just getting kind of to the table with that. So in terms of number of signs, size of signs, we've typically been less and smaller than other Valley cities. So with this am amendment, like Christopher said, council was kind of asking us to level the playing field a little bit, but what you would see in surprise, and as you drive around, especially like Tempe or other East Valley cities, you're probably seeing larger signs and more signs. Uh, again, typically Goodyear, we've been more conservative with what we allow. And we're not changing any of that in terms of the sign code. Like Christopher mentioned, we're not allowing more signs or anything. It's just another type of sign type that we're allowing, another option. <clears throat> I I don't know what the rest of the commissioners feel. Um, again, I I trust the staff. I think you guys put in some good work. The more and more I think about it, though, and we discuss it, I feel like it should be baked a little bit more. And I don't know how. I mean, I just don't think. I feel like it was a little rush. I know we went through our process. Um, but I think there should be a little bit more discussion about, uh, you know, because that can really change the feel and look um, uh, of the city. And I know that in some places it's, you know, it should be, you know, accepted and other things like that. Again, I'm not against that technology, but I know I hesitate to just send this recommendation forward saying, yeah, but at the same time, I don't want to just kill it on its face. I don't know how everybody else feels, but I'm, for the first time, I'm a little hesitant about pushing something forward. We are setting a precedent. If we, if we pass this, we are setting a precedent. And we have to think, you know, ahead. And the, you mentioned a really good thing about the feel of the city, you know. At the same time. So I, I agree, and, and as a business owner and a resident, um, I'm very cautious about these kinds of signs. Um, but I also understand we want to be able to compete. And though the city says we're not at any disadvantage because of their sales ability, which is awesome, and attracting the right businesses, we don't want to miss out on an opportunity Absolutely. just because of a digital sign. And because it's not, from what I understand, because it's not changing the frequency, then the amount of signs that are available, or that they can't all of a sudden have 14 monuments, and I know that's an extreme example, but more than what is currently allowed in the statutes, I, I don't, number one, I don't think every business is going to do it, right. for number one. Number two, I, I don't believe that it's going to be as detrimental to the visual impact of the city as is what's being discussed from a yes there are three monument signs on the south side of mcdowell currently up to six down to the hotels of bullard that's not a gigantic amount if that's what's being limited today i don't see goodyear as having an exorbitant amount of signage for businesses on the roads even on a litchfield side where you have the best buy and the target and all of that there's not a whole lot of signage so it, I'm not as concerned with the frequency of the numbers of the signs. Um, the, the movement in that, I understand you're taking national standards, which is fantastic, but even just being able to change concerns me because that does give a visual impact, especially in the evening and at night, whether it's safety or not. I, I obviously would hope that national standards would be safe, but so I, I am torn as well. Um, but Mr. Chairman, can I interject one second? Please do. So this is a fabulous discussion, and I uh, really appreciate appreciate it. Um, so thank you for it and the questions and, and so forth. Um, in the course of your deliberation tonight, I, I just would ask one thing. Uh, wh whatever it is that the commission decides to do tonight, that we that we do take a vote because this does need to go to council on the 26th. So whether or not you recommend something with some modifications or if you 
are not supportive or are support, whatever it is, uh, I, we would ask for your vote, whatever it is tonight. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You know, if you look at that area from Texas Roadhouse down to Pebble Creek Parkway, mm -hmm. and you got three monument signs right there, it really doesn't take away from anything. Now, the, the one thing that you have to consider that you mentioned, Brian, is the movement in a sign, if you put that up. But then on the other hand, it was also brought up, not every business is going to do it. Right. Which, which is it's very true. I mean, I really... I, <laughs> you're stuck between a rock and a hard place on this. Um, I, th I think as, as long as it works in with the uh, architecture, and, and that's going to be one thing. Now, at 10 o'clock at night, it goes off. So now all of a sudden you don't have this sudden eye-catching movement in signs. Is that the case? Because isn't that if it's only within 150 feet of a single family residential area? Yeah. Yeah, otherwise it stays on. So basically, oh, okay. so basically, Even Pebble, when yeah, Pebble Creek down. and yes. McDowell stay on. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, uh, where are we at here? Speakers cards? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone from the public wish to address the commission? <laughs> yes, sir. And then when you're finished, make sure you just fill out a speaker's card for this one, right? Yes, please. When you're finished, just make sure you fill out a speaker's card for this Somebody agenda. Knows the mask, I don't feel well <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We read lips a lot. Uh, two quick points. I've heard the word safety a number of times tonight. The real word is distraction. Yeah. We need to add any more distractions to all the existing signs and types of signs and traffic control signs that we already have. Second point, I don't know how many of us are active on social media. There's a phenomenon called FOMO, fear of missing out. And I can envision cars stopped at a stoplight at an entrance to a shopping strip mall or whatever, waiting for that sign to change to see what the next one is. I wish. Chief Rodriguez were here for you to ask him his opinion on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, any other discussion? Commissioner Barnes, we have not heard from you. Do you have anything? Um, I do have something. Is my voice coming through this time? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have lived next to an electronic sign, at least 500 feet away. And even in the daytime, it was a nuisance. So I would not support electronic signs unless they could be a minimum of half a mile from any residential district, <laughs> single family or multifamily. Because I can tell you, somebody's not going to be happy. And in fact, I am not opposed to having no electronic signs in our city. I don't think they offer that much. And in fact, um, from what I know about many of these signs from my practice, um, once they get to a certain size, they have to have cooling. So basically you have to build an air conditioner for the lift sign. So from an energy, energy standpoint, not only are you using energy to light the sign, in many cases, you're also quadrupling the energy to cool the sign so that you can see it in the daytime. And that is all the comments I have. Okay. Um, I guess uh, I'll... Any other questions? I will entertain a motion on agenda item number five. Okay. 
any kind of a motion. <laughs> oh, can you close the public hearing? Oh, we'll close the public hearing. So clearly, <laughs> no one wants to make a motion. Um, let me ask uh, maybe either Christopher or Sarah, you could weigh in here. Is there a mechanism by which our recommendation is the uh, city council puts together a study committee on this ordinance to look into it further? So or, or some type of a um, more robust way to get comments from the public? Because I do feel, I mean, I know that you guys went through your process, but I just feel like, man, if people do this, we would probably have a little bit longer line out the door about how we should do something. So that's that's maybe my feeling is, is there something we can pitch back to council saying, we recommend you go this path that a little bit more work gets done rather than a straight up yes or no vote? I, I think you have to have a yes or no vote, but in in our um, in in our um, staff reports, we always include kind of the discussion that was had in you know and and what your thoughts are. So what you could say, you know, if you're voting against it, you're moving moving to vote against it. You could say based on what we've seen so far and the lack of public discussion, you know, we may be in favor of, of it if we had more discussion or we had these types of issues considered, but based on what was what we have in front of us, we vote no, but you have to have a yes or no vote. So the only way really to accomplish it would be to vote no, but state on the record the kinds of things that you'd like to say that see that you might be willing to reconsider that. And at least it gives them food for thought. So we'll do a, um, basically, I think how we accomplish that is a roll call vote and someone, if they want to, they can explain their vote. Right. So it's on the record. Right. Okay. There you go. So does anybody want to just start with a motion? Okay. I'll All right, excuse me. Commissioner Nelson, did you have a question about? Well, I have a question for you specifically, because you, you said something very interesting to me, which is if, if we feel <laughs> that we would have a line out the door of people protesting this if they knew it was happening, shouldn't, and don't we have an obligation then to vote against it, I guess is my only, I, I, I want to make sure I understand being the greenest person here. Yeah, I, I think that um, if, if you feel what is on paper today, which is the um, ordinance that the staff has brought forward, if it either needs more discussion or you think that it needs more public input or whatever, then obviously, yeah, you would uh, vote no against it. Perfect. Thank you. Well, I guess it depends on how someone puts the motion, but if that's a motion right. to approve, then you could vote Yeah, you could either no. recommend to approve or recommend to deny. Right. Correct. Right. So are you making a motion, I'm Mr. Clymer? i Well, I, early on, I told you how I felt, so I would <laughs> recommend, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we uh, deny approval of the Two zero two zero dash seven zero six four. I second. It has been uh, moved by Commissioner Clymer, seconded by Commissioner Maloney, to um, not approve agenda item number four two zero two zero dash seven zero six the amendment to Article 7 and 9 of the zoning ordinance. And with that, is there any discussion? Seeing none, um, Madam Secretary, will you please do a roll call vote? And if you wish to explain your vote at this time, please do so. Commissioner Ellison? <laughs> An affirmative is to deny it, correct? Yeah, correct. Thank you. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Clymer? Aye. Commissioner Steiner? Aye. Commissioner Maloney? Aye. Vice Chairman Barnes? Aye. Chairman Bray? Um, I'm going to go ahead and explain my vote, and hopefully I capture some of your opinions. <laughs> um, Obviously, lots of discussion, good discussion. I think this is um, 
uh, how things should go. I think that um, from my perspective, uh, there is a big question about whether we should have this or not in general that needs a little bit more uh, public input. Um, I think if we had maybe a special work group or something that really dug into this a little deeper, again, I appreciate the work of the staff. I think you've done exactly what you're asked to do. Uh, no fault on your part. I think it's just trying to look beyond uh, what's on paper and how that looks and what the feel and the look of the city is uh, if we move forward with this. Uh, personally, I feel uh, for whatever reason, this seems to be a little bit rushed, uh, not on staff's part, but you know, here I was, you know, it was on the agenda. And then when we start thinking about it, um, I thought we'd see a little bit more participation. So uh, I think there's opportunity. I know personally, I'm not uh, opposed to this type of sign, but I am uh, very concerned about uh, the look and, and how it presents moving forward that I, I think we need a little bit more exploration on. So with that, um, I vote aye. Motion passes. Um, you have failed to pass uh, agenda item number five, article seven and nine of the zoning ordinance. So Mr. Chairman, just for clarification, we'll forward to the council. This is going on the 26th. The recommendation of denial from the commission for um, the synopsis that you that you mentioned during during the vote. Perfect. Thank you. Um, agenda item number six: uh, recreational marijuana establishment zoning ordinance text amendment. Katie, how lucky are you? This is probably a fun one to work on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. If you thought the last one was rushed, wait until you hear right? this one. <laughs> I got to open the public hearing because I am excited. I can't believe there's not more people here with this. Me too. Yeah. Does it seem like the heat comes on and then the cold comes on? And then... Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm either freezing or all of a sudden get hot. I think I'm just getting old. It's the Rona. <laughs> They've been digging yeah. at your nose too long. <laughs> I had that done on my head, <laughs> my scalp. I was going to give our secretary a moment to get that too. Oh, she had to get more paper. <laughs> right on. Is she going to be gone more than two minutes? Can... She's right there. Oh, you're right, Kate. She's going to run out. You've already opened the public meeting. Do you need a recess? That'd be nice. Do you mind taking a quick two minute recess? Three minutes? We'll recess for three minutes. <laughs> we'll reconvene uh, the planning and zoning meeting and we'll move on to agenda item number six. Katie. Thank you, Chair, members of the commission. So there is a ballot measure on um, the election, Prop 207, which is known as the Smart and Safe Arizona Act. And what this act does is authorize the consumption, sale, processing, manufacture of marijuana products. Um, marijuana establishments would be licensed by the state, but their, um, their number is not limited or otherwise regulated. Um, and so we are before you tonight because if we do wish to regulate these types of businesses, we need to do so before the ballot measure is effective. It doesn't have to, it has to be, um, and my understanding is it's effective once the um, canvas of the election is completed. Um, there was, and it's funny, it was also known as Prop 27, but the Private Property Rights Protection Act, which was um, adopted, which was passed, um, I think a little more than 10 years ago, um, really limits um, the city's ability to change regulations. Um, so basically you can give more rights, but you can't restrict rights within land use law. And so that's part of the reason why it's um, critical for us to do this before the ballot, because if it passes, they would basically be treated, um, marijuana sale would just be a retail sale. And if you wanted to restrict it after the fact, you'd um, possibly risk what we'd call a Prop 207 claim. Mm -hmm. 
So as I go through this, I admittedly, um, we are being very restrictive with the regulations. We can always go back and ease the restrictions. It's much more difficult to um, start out with easier restrictions and then try and limit if you later find there's problems. So first, um, to give some context with the medical marijuana regulations, um, zoning regulations were adopted in 2011 for medical marijuana. There is one medical marijuana facility in Goodyear. It's in the central portion of Goodyear. Um, however, medical marijuana facilities were regulated and limited by the um, ballot. Um, it was related to the number of pharmacies. So one medical marijuana facility was permitted for every 10 pharmacies in the state. Somebody did those calculations and it turns out that there were about 130 facilities that could be allowed. So what the state did was to ensure there wasn't an over concentration in any one area is they use these already existing um, they're called CHAWs, Community Health Analysis Areas, and said we'll allow one per CHAW. Eventually, you know, some of the more rural areas didn't get a license, so then they later did a lottery system to allow certain CHAWs to have more than one. But pretty much they use this CHAW system. Um, in the metro Phoenix area, probably Tucson too, each CHAW is about 100,000 people. In the more rural areas, it's more like 10,000 people per chaw, so it's not consistent, but um, it, it was about 100,000 people per chaw in um, the metro area. So what staff is recommending um, the changes in the zoning ordinance is first um, to Article 2, which is our definitions, adding several of the definitions that are included in the ballot measure. The two I wanted to highlight was um, the ballot does define marijuana establishment as a facility for retail sales, cultivation, or manufacturing. That's really a wide range of uses, you know, in other things, you know, that's um, retail sales, agriculture, and industrial, um, all under one umbrella. They also introduced this idea of dual licensing, which is um, a facility that has both um, a recreational marijuana license and medical marijuana wanna um, licensing. Article three is the zoning district. So this is simply where we said what zoning districts um, these would be allowed in. Medical marijuana was permitted in our light industrial um, I-1 and general industrial I-2 districts. So what we um, did here was we added dual license facilities were permitted in those same districts like medical marijuana. But what this has a the effect of since we're only outright permitting the dual license facility is that a marijuana establishment that is not associated with medical marijuana would not be permitted. Which then the base, it has the effect of only having one facility per chaw, if that makes sense, because that is what the regulations are for medical marijuana. So this would um, limit the number of facilities in Goodyear to the existing one in effect. Um, so article four um, is our special uses section. And this is the um, kind of the meat of the regulations, which we go through more in the staff report. But um, again, we have no control over what the state does and we don't know, excuse me, right now what the state will do with medical marijuana if recreational marijuana is allowed what does that do to medical marijuana licensing will anybody try and get this so we would like to adopt those chaws um, for Goodyear um, so we're going to keep that same um, methodology that the state came up with as a way of avoiding over concentration of these types of facilities but again, we're concerned that the state could get rid of the CHAWs or change medical facilities, which is why we want the city to adopt those CHAWs ourselves so then we have control over it. Um, it would allow, um, we would follow the recommendation of allowing one facility per CHAW, and I'll show you the map in a moment. There are actually two CHAWs in Goodyear. However, um, 
in all fairness, one of the um, areas is in very South Goodyear and currently there's no industrial zoned land down there. There's also very limited services. So it'd be incredibly challenging to develop a facility down there. Um, these would be allowed by zoning permit. A zoning permit is an administrative um, permit. So it would not, um, these facilities would not come to planning commission or council for approval. The city would make sure that they meet all the regulations in the zoning ordinance and then issue their permit if they do. Um, one thing I want to note is that, again, these facilities, um, th this is already existing in our zoning ordinance for medical marijuana facilities, these separations. So these separations would apply to the um, recreational marijuana facilities as well. And so they are required to be separated from um, residential districts, a thousand feet from schools, public parks, libraries, places of worship, 2,000 feet from um, licensed residential substance abuse facilities and 1,000 feet from adult businesses. Um, they also have to be separated from each other, but um, that almost becomes a moot point when you have the one per chaw regulation anyway. And then this is the map we're asking you to adopt. I know Goodyear looks very big here. So basically all of Goodyear is in one chaw with the gas line that goes down in Mobile is the dividing line between the two chaws. And this is the zoning map. So you can see there's no industrial zoning. There's one little industrial zoning. That's the Lufthansa airstrip in this area. But most of our industrial zoning districts are um, north of the Gila River. So this would have the effect of greatly limiting um, these facilities, pretty much just allowing one. Um, I didn't call it out in my presentation. The other thing I wanted to note is there are a lot of regulations about the size of facilities, the size of storage areas in the existing medical marijuana. Um, the biggest one of importance being that a facility is um, limited to 2,500 square feet. We did write in there that for um, a dual license facility, they can go up to 5,000 square feet. So if the existing facility wanted to get the um, license for the recreational marijuana, they can almost double in size. There have been no objections received. We haven't gotten any inquiries. Um, we recommend approval of these regulations. And I do wanna know, you may have a lot of questions about this. Um, we're tonight really focusing on the zoning ordinance issue. Um, the city code addresses issues such as smoking in public um, and um, those types of uses. So that's not the purview of the Planning and Zoning Commission. I mean, if you do have questions, we can try and answer them. Um, but we are really um, focused tonight on discussing, you know, retail sales, manufacturing using these substances, um, cultivation using these substances. Um, and that's what we're prepared to discuss before you tonight. So that concludes my presentation. And um, I'd be happy to answer questions. I got a question. <laughs> Commissioner Steiner <laughs> and then Commissioner you, Mr. Chairman, did no. you open the public oh, hearing? Oh, public hearing is open. <laughs> a chaw is how many, does it work off the population? Is that correct? Yes. I, um, according to the Arizona Department of Health Services, they, the Arizona Department of Health Services was the entity that created these. They stated um, that they use census data to create them. And um, in the urban areas, there are about 100,000 people per chaw. So the chaw for Goodyear does extend outside of Goodyear a little bit. Well, um, yeah, we're not over 100,000 yet. Right. So, okay. Looking, looking forward in the future, if 207 passes, you're going to have several chaws as the city grows. Thank you. That would be, that's why if we adopt the map, the chaws are the way they are on the map. Unless commission and council take action to change those chaws. We're locked in. It just They will two. be locked in. because That's why we're asking you and then council to adopt these specifically so that we then have control. The reason I'm discussing the state is that's where, you know, that's um, what we used as the precedent 
for creating these is, you know, state created, the state created this method methodology. They thought it was important to make sure there wasn't an over concentration of these facilities. We agree. And so we thought, again, part of it is we are moving through this quickly. Um, so we thought it was best to use their original methodology as the method to um, avoid an over concentration. Okay. So in the future, the city of Goodyear co could um, add additional chaws as our population grows. We could leave it exactly how it is. Um, we could remove them completely. So if it's left as it is, you can add more later on. Right. If we pass this ordinance tonight, it just locks in the two and that's it, done and said. Right. Okay. Yes, and so if the state changed the chaws, it wouldn't impact this for recreational marijuana in the city of Goodyear. Okay, so no matter what the legislature did, mm -hmm. this is it. Right. Okay. And again, as, as you know, there's a lot of unknowns how the licensing would with, would work. With some of the other licensing, often um, the Department of Health Services will ask for that zoning permit from us before they'll issue the license. The state usually works very closely with the um, city planning departments to make sure that they're not issuing licenses to these entities unless they know the city's okay with it. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Maloney. So with the um, the recreational marijuana, could they apply for licensing or a permit to grow the marijuana under agriculture? Thank you. Um, they could not. Because all these types of establishments are under one umbrella of marijuana establishment. And so these rules I just went through are now grabbing everything under that marijuana establishment. Um, so they, that is not permitted in the agricultural district. We're saying that's permitted in the industrial district. I will tell you that the um, medical marijuana facility we have in Goodyear does have cultivation too. Um, so they are doing indoor cultivation at the existing site. So presumably, if they um, get a recreational marijuana license, they will be doing growing for recreational marijuana. But it will be done inside? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, we're saying that's permitted, but it's completely indoors. And they there can are a lot of. That? Yeah. Hmm? Can they change I, that? Can, can the state change the law on that? Be I mean, I don't know. We're opening doors here. Makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, if this passes, my understanding is this will just be considered, you know, a crop. There will be marijuana fields in Arizona. I know. I know? mean, that's I mean, what I'm. That's what I'm. <laughs> saying. Unless you limit it in the zoning district. So, Mr. Chairman, if, can I, I, Go right ahead. if I can interject one second? So the cultivation that Katie was alluding to is required by city ordinance to be inside, and it apply with, for both the medical and also the recreational. So regardless if the state says you can have 40 acres and a mule and go grow what you want, um, the city's regulations would say it's got to be inside. But the city can change their mind about that. Right. Yes, the city can change our mind about it. If we, if it passes and we move forward with these regulations, maybe we see experiences in other cities and say, hey, you know, let's revisit this issue. Um, we can absolutely do that. Commissioner Ellison. It's probably something that we should talk about afterwards. But <laughs> so I born and raised in Colorado. That's what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> They've ruined because they didn't do what their Goodyear is proposing to do. They ruined Soho. Every stupid location and what turned first medical, then went recreational and all the bars. It's so bad. I took my son back, and I know this is totally off topic, but I took him to a concert in Denver because one of his favorite places to go was Red Rocks. They were kicking people out for smoking cigarettes, but everybody was smoking pot. The irony is just pathetic. So that you brought up the smoking issue, mm -hmm. and I hope that we are consistent about non-smoking is not smoking, regardless of what you're smoking. But the other thing is crops, they will never grow outdoors in Arizona. It's too hot. It's too warm. Not, 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 not a state that you can grow Arizona no, no. And marijuana. Nope. Not at all. 
Yeah, they just tried hemp and it's failed miserably. Right, right. You can control it inside. Um, so just a quick... Commissioner Clymer. I just want to say I think it's great that we're getting ahead of this and it needs to be done. Agreed. Um, my question is, can we go even further and just say, because I haven't read the whole initiative, but can we just say for now we don't, we're not going to permit a recreational facility and start there? Thank you, Chair, and um, I might get some help here, but we could certainly propose that. We are trying to take a position of reasonable restrictions. When you outlaw something, you know, just outright, it, I think, makes you more susceptible um, to criticism, but um, what we're okay doing is a very reasonable, <laughs> we, we would recommend applying very reasonable restrictions. This is a way for us to... Um, make sure there's not an over concentration. That's why we pointed to the state's methodology. We're not starting from scratch. We're using a tried and true method that the state has enacted. Um, and so, um, but there, there's one existing facility in Goodyear and I'm, I apologize. I don't have any like crime statistics or anything, but I haven't heard of any problems with the existing facility. Um, so that one existing facility could convert to a recreational marijuana facility. So, and I and I mm -hmm. sincerely appreciate that, and I, I see where you're coming from, mm -hmm. and from a city standpoint, um, totally understand that line of thinking. So then I flip it and play devil's advocate. We're saying, okay, we're going to take a reasonable approach, and we don't know what's happened on November 3rd, and we have to do that for the whole chicken and egg thing. And so <coughs> then it goes back to we probably should have a little bit more input from our citizens if we – even like recreational marijuana or not. And that's why I say start with no, mm -hmm. let it pass, see how it does, and you can always build off of there. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to say, you know, we need to make a stance on 207, but my thought process is, again, it's a no, so we don't have that problem. Watch Phoenix or whoever wants to dabble in recreational marijuana um, and and build off of that. I guess that's just a comment. It's not really a question, but I guess the so the question is, yes, we could recommend or, or we have to vote yes or no here and say, we should say, you know, Goodyear should not be a place for recreational marijuana facilities. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I Again, we're, all the cities are dealing with this at the same time, so I don't have a lot of good information, but I believe that there are some cities in Arizona that are going to prohibit it outright. Which is where I, I think that <laughs> we should start. Knowing that if things come along and we understand it better, you know, the door, the door isn't permanently closed, but Again, I think you're asking a handful of us citizens to make a pretty big decision on quietly, con you know, highly contested issue. And it doesn't stop anybody from going to get marijuana, just they have to go outside the city limits to get it. Just my thought. You know, the other thing is, and I'll be perfectly honest, um, this scares me from a woman that's been in recovery for 30 years. And, you know, I think that it's, I, I have, I have a lot of issues with this, you know, um, people call it a gateway drug. Um, I, uh, I see that, but it doesn't affect everybody that way. And it just makes me nervous because you look at the statistics of, of people, of adults, that have gone through horrific times in their life. And, you know, I was in college. I had a great time. I paid for it. Uh, but is that something that, is that the business that we want to get into in, in this community? And so the question is, we're, we're, in a, we're in a tough place because we need to, to at least start, you know. Um, and, but it does scare me. The big, the big decision 
it isn't the people that frequent it. it, it most of those places are pretty regulated. They don't have a lot of hoodlums hanging around, gangbangers, that kind of crap. The, the decision is the marijuana that was around in the 60s and the early 70s is not the same marijuana That's that you're getting today. Absolutely. That's right. where the problem is. Right. I don't know. Is it good or better? I've never touched the stuff, so... <laughs> <laughs> Just say it's probably more Should enhanced I, today. Should I start? I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know what? Let's, uh, Commissioner Barnes, do you want to weigh in on this? Uh, yes, I think staff's on the right track. That's all I have. All right. Well, you know, I think. I appreciate you uh, bringing this forward. I, I, uh, I get where staff stands. I, I, I just believe that we should start at no recreational and we can move forward later, but that's just my opinion. And I'm only one man. So uh, with that, uh, is there any speakers cards, uh, comments from the public? Floor is all yours, guys. Oh wait, I gotta close the public hearing. Up to you guys. So Katie, one more quick question. So if we approve this, then um, that give us gives us the base for the state, the, the city moving forward to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, and we're only going to allow this. The, what we're doing tonight is is we're voting on the groundwork of this um, this bill. Thank you. It's it's a change to the zoning ordinance. Right. So um, if you um, recommend approval and then council approves it, and we do also, I should I should have noted we have it written so that. This change will only only be effective if the ballot passes. Okay. If the ballot doesn't pass, the zoning ordinance won't be changed. Okay. Um, so, so potentially so, there could be two recreational facilities in Goodyear with this ordinance change if the ballot measure passes. If we pass this. Well, I guess the way I'd say it is, if the ballot passes the day after canvassing, the um, somebody the existing medical marijuana facility could request a zoning permit for recreational marijuana. And it's up to the city to control what that license looks like. Well, we don't issue a license. We issue a zoning permit. So we zoning would, permit. all we'd be looking at is making sure these are still met because again, if they say expanded their facility, it may change some of these boundaries because we measure building to property line. Um, so, you know, we would make sure, does it meet all these requirements? Is it the right size? All the regulations that are in the zoning ordinance. And if they meet it, we would say, here's your zoning permit. And then whatever the state is doing with their licensing, they would do. You know, I, I don't know what the state is doing with their license requirements. But there could not be more than that one in that char, correct? Right. So that's so it. Somebody else says, right. hey, I would I would like to, op you know, I have a tobacco shop or a vape shop and I'd like to start selling, um, you know, marijuana cartridges in my vape shop. We'd right. say, nope, you can't do that. Right. Even if that gets up to 500,000 people. Right now. Right. Right. So we now, should... down here, somebody could say, right. hey, I have a piece of property down here. I'd like to rezone it Correct. to industrial. That's what I was getting. That could be the second, but only and down And then, there. you know, with the impact of opening a marijuana facility, that is, you know, I should say a risk. Again, I think it, it's highly unlikely because yeah. there are not, sir, there's not water and wastewater. A commercial facility of any kind can't be built. The reason we did this, though, again, was to be fair in adopting the state methodology right. that had two chaws. And follow their original boundaries. It, it also is also, I think it's also important to point out that right now we're only allowing them with the license for medical marijuana facility. So we're not creating, we might have an expanded use, a current one might go from 2,500 to 5,000 to 4 feet, but it's already an allowed use. And the right. risk that we have, and I know, you know, I think the risk that you have when you try not to come up with some of these. 
local regulations, which this is being forced on us because it's being dictated by the people. They very well could come back and say, we don't want any zoning limitations. We want it treated like, you know, where you sell tobacco, you can sell marijuana. So you could have, you know, a boomerang effect where they come back and do this. You did ask about, you know, what the state did, if they could do something. They could come in and say, this is a matter of statewide concern to preempt everything we do and then tell us to do something even more onerous, maybe even to avoid what they think, you know, an initiative, a, a future initiative would, would do. So, I mean, you're kind of playing a game of chicken where, but I, I think what staff tried to do is do we see more adapting our own shots because we're concerned that the state would get out of the business of regulating it once it was a free for all? So that's why we adopted this map, you know, instead of proposing that, so we can control what comes in the thing. But it will always be linked to something that is a medical marijuana facility. It has to be part of the rules. So my question to that, though, is <clears throat> if you start at no recreational facility, prior to the passage of the ballot, then you can't go to this or you could potentially go to this as the next step because you watch how it goes down and you say, okay, we like a little recreational marijuana. Yeah, if you, if you <laughs> had time to get it in place before, um, I think there was some thought that uh, the council was was comfortable with the idea of allowing dual facilities, but not necessarily these standalone facilities. Um, right now, what you see is people getting medical marijuana cards because they have a headache, you know? So I, I think there's a, 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 a fiction going on in terms of who's, who's going in and who's going to do it and going to do it. So I think there's some, some belief in the council or some appetite that says, hey, we're okay because we already have this facility. We can expand that use. Um, if you take a look at the regulations that are in place, you know, the drafts of the ordinances, I mean, they have to be locked up. They have to have security. They have limited limited space um, that's open to the public. Um, I don't think we've had any issues with our medical marijuana facility. I didn't but, know yet. You know, I mean, arguably, you could try to, to say, we're not going to do anything. We're going to prohibit it. We couldn't get it in before the passage of that when it, it came in. But I think there is some appetite on the council to say, hey, we already have these. They could already locate here a second one down south. So we're okay with just being the first one to kind of see it through here. Because no one's going down south this year. You know, there's just not enough population already. I don't think. I don't know. I think the natural ones exist down south without regulation, but. So are you ready for a motion? I am ready for a motion, yeah. All right. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve 2020-7093, uh, the Recreational Marijuana Establishment Zoning. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Clymer, seconded by Commissioner Steiner, to approve agenda item number six, Marijuana Establishment Zoning Ordinance Text Amendment. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, um, I think we should probably do a roll call vote. Commissioner Ellison? Aye. Commissioner Clymer? Aye. Commissioner Steiner? Aye. Commissioner Maloney? Aye. Uh, Vice Chairman Barnes? Aye. Chairman Bray? <laughs> no. Motion passes. <laughs> I thought I... Sorry to put all you on the spot. I thought there would be a few more. <laughs> but I don't mind being the lone one. Um, uh, motion passes. Thank you. Um, agenda item number seven. Uh, election of officers. So I guess we'll just take nominations from the floor. Start with Chairman. And if I could, I just want to make sure that you all received the information we sent out as far as term times and when they were expiring. Yeah, I think everybody's here for another two years at least, right? Mm -hmm. Well, do you let, let's put it this way. I, I, you know, there's no reason to get into a, a contest of who's got the bigger one, but are, do you want to be, continue to be chairman? I don't mind. No, I don't mind Fine. at all. Uh, you know, Randy? 
you want to continue to be vice? You're up there somewhere. <laughs> um, it, I, I don't mind either. Whatever this well, body decides. Say, if you don't want, I'd fine with me. To do it, but I know you're off quite a bit, so. You don't turn out? No, I don't turn out for two years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And same with Randy. Same with Randy. We're on the same one, so we both turn out. He's, he's trying to say something. No. Sorry, go ahead, Mr. Barnes. No, I'm just, I'm just saying I, I'm also fine with not being nominated. So. Uh, so do you just want to make a motion? Mr. Clymer, that we, well, I don't know what my motion's going to be. <laughs> I move that we retain the current oh, uh, <laughs> officers in the positions that they're there, at there there. for the coming uh, session. Yeah, yeah, because they're just one year, right? We do this every year anyway. Yes, sir, that's correct, one year. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved by Commissioner Steiner, second by Commissioner Maloney. Uh, to continue uh, myself as chairman and vice chairman uh, Barnes as vice chairman. Uh, is there any discussion? No. Nope. Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Carries. Um, well, you, you know, you, you we had to make like it you interesting. To do it, so I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm fine. I would, I'm fine with doing it. Um, staff communication. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's real simple. Um, the PowerPoint simple. The uh, just to kind of go over a couple of items as we normally do. Just have a little readout for you in terms of our. Um, the cases that you recently considered. So what I just pulled up, I probably pulled up a little bit because now all you all are looking there and I should well, have waited. It just came out in the news yes, yes. today or yes. yesterday. But to go over our uh, cases that you uh, recently recommended to council, Civic Square Parcel A, if you remember that, was the um, just north of uh, McDowell, south of Monte Vista, where the future city hall is located. Uh, that went to council and was approved. Australia 9.8 community in Australia was approved. You remember last month we had a very vigorous discussion on the trotter, trotter track um, that we tabled until November 4th. So there's been a lot of communication between staff and the applicant on that particular project. And it will be coming back up um, on November 4th for your consideration again. And then uh, if you remember, Katie presented the MF12 single family rental zoning ordinance as well as the design guidelines and that also went to council for and was approved. Council did modify that, those design guidelines. When Katie, we originally presented that to you, we required two elevations for a single family rental project. Council modified it to require three. So, um, and then secondly, is a just a friendly reminder about our special meeting on October 21st. 21st. Yes, it will be in room 117. 117 at City Hall. So that will technically be our offsite planning commission meeting for the Wagner general plan amendment. And it'll be at six o'clock. So look forward to seeing you all there. And then lastly, I pulled up on the screen as you can see. Um, and I know you may not be able to read it, but I just at least wanted to be able to present it to you. The city was notified of something. Well, let me back up. As you know, and you've heard us say many times, we are an organization to continuous improvement, and it is really through the dedication of the leadership of the city, not only at city manager's office, but also through our managers and supervisors throughout the city, and especially Katie and uh, Steve Sinto and the management team in engineering and, and development services, of creating a culture of continuous improvement that results uh, in better efficiency um, for our customers, but also um, creates more predictability in the, in the overall process. And it's been a journey that we've been on, as you've heard me talk about this before, over the last five years. And so uh, last month, uh, September 14th, as a matter of fact, we were notified from the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry that the city has been selected, uh, unanimously selected as the winner of the Best City for Business Award, which is quite a... Um, an honor. It's the only one award they give to any city in the state. This is a statewide <laughs> organization. The Arizona Chamber is. And so it, it really is a kudo to, to the city as itself. But I just want to point out a couple of things, if I can. Um, the, the criteria, which are bullet, bulletized here, um, 
talk about efforts to streamline processes, setting clear expectations on permitting and approvals, competitive fee structures, effective communications with stakeholders, knowledge and responsible ECDEV and development services staff, transparency to the public, effective uh, city leadership and, um, and city manager effectiveness, flexibility in allowing businesses time to correct uh, code violations. We don't have a whole lot of that in the city of Goodyear. Um, but also uh, the, the opinions of the, of the folks on the committee. And the committee was made up of uh, commercial real estate folks, uh, business entrepreneurs, small and large, a, a wide variety. Don't know their names or anything of that nature, but it was a committee and it was a unanimous recommendation. So my whole point in bringing this forward is to also, it just goes to show that all the good work that Katie and the planning team and the staff in the building all the planners, all the way, all our friends in engineering, legal services with Sarah, um, how we've all come together to really change the culture. And this is a recognition from a statewide organization about the success and what we have achieved together. This isn't about me and it's not about the, you know, Samit Mohan, the engineering director. It's about the team and their commitment to do their best and the professionalism that Katie and the team have. So I really just wanted to take a moment and just um, thank everybody for that and highlight this to you, Commission, because you all play a part in this as well. Um, and thank you for your time and service and, and helping the city to grow and develop in a responsible way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kudos to you guys. I think that's a, a huge accomplishment and it uh, highlights your guys' efforts in many ways. And like you said, it's a, a team and you're privileged to lead that team and we probably just your thorns in your side to keep you busy but um thank you guys and that that is a huge huge accomplishment um well done um any other comments for staff all right the next planning and zoning commission meeting will be a special meeting held on october 21st 2020 at 6 p.m at goodyear city council room 117 there being no further business discussed this meeting is adjourned <laughs>